after my freshman year in college, I went to officer candidate school. And to be honest with you, you know, I had all these big grand ideas for the last, you know, two, three years. I knew what I wanted to do, but I, when I went to OCS, that was the first real hurdle. I mean, everything else was either an idea, a plan, some paperwork. I get to the officer candidate school and it's like, okay, there's a real Marine drill instructor screaming at you. You know, you're really doing the, the deed there. And getting through OCS was a big thing for me because it was the first real test of, did I, you know, I knew what I wanted to do, but I had no real sense if I had what was required to be a Marine. And I think as a kid, you build up what that is in your mind as a larger than life thing. Like, how could anybody possibly do this? You turn it into something more than it is. When I went to boot camp, there was a there was a Navy SEAL there, right? And I, I swear, when I saw him, I was like, God, look at that. He was huge. I mean, huge, big, giant forearms and yeah. big, just a big, massive guy. It just looked like a destroyer of human life. And I was like, oh, my God. So fast forward four years I'm in the teams and I meet this guy and he's not at all man it was completely in my head yeah, yeah. it was completely in my head that this guy was such a destroyer but I just thought hey he's a seal he must be a destroyer and I, I actually saw it that way yeah you can't help it it's certainly at that age I mean those those things are real powerful influences when you get out to OCS and all of a sudden you're like oh man I need to I didn't make this happen uh, that was a big, big achievement in my life. That I said, "Hey, I, I can do this." Okay, I started to realize I'm not the biggest guy in the Marine Corps. Nobody's going to mistake me for a destroyer. <laughs> um, but what I discovered as I got there is I, I, I knew mentally what I wanted to do. It wasn't a real question mark about my intentions or my desires. And I was surrounded by tough, strong kids. You know, young kids my age that are trying to be Marine officers. And that's that's a physical and a mental challenge. There's no doubt about it. And I was seeing guys kind of left and right of me that looked at least bigger, faster, stronger, tougher, and more capable than me. They looked like that, that same image you have in your mind. And I'm watching these dudes kind of fall out of stuff or not finish stuff fast enough or just straight up quit. Um, you know, guys would DOR, drop on requests at OCS. And I was kind of looking around thinking, what's, you know, what's going on? You know, why are you here if your plan wasn't to <laughs> yeah. get through it? So that was a good, a, a really good thing for me psychologically to realize that it wasn't just a kind of a fantasy or a dream. I, I, I had, I had the potential of being able to do this. So I got through OCS. Um, you know, that's kind of a painful process. As you know, it's 84 days. It can be, it can be slog and you lose a lot of folks doing it for a whole host of di different reasons. Some people get hurt. Some people quit. Some people just can't do it. Uh, and when you get on the backside of that, you're like I can, I can make this happen. Let's get that air contract. Well, we'll get to that air contract at, at the basic school. <laughs> yeah. So, which is when you get your commission, you, you finish school, you get your degree, finish officer candidate school. And so basically it's, hey, you've done everything that you need. You, you're a commission officer. I became a second lieutenant in the Marine Corps in June of 1994. And the first thing you do on active duty as a Marine is you go to something called the basic school. I know you've talked about it a few times. It's basically a school for the Marine Corps that teaches officers a little bit of everything. It doesn't teach you everything of anything, but you get a little exposure to infantry, exposure to tanks, artillery, call for fire, a little bit of exposure to aviation, patrolling, defense offense. So you kind of get a whole way in the land. And the whole point of that for the Marine Corps is you go there with 250 people, and they got to give each one of those people an assignment, you know, a particular job, an MOS, a specialty. Um, and they rank you. I mean, you are ranked from 1 to 250. And for aviation, when I got there, I remember getting there the first week, they kind of announced what billets are going to be available. Oh, we're going to have, you know, 40 infantry slots and 20, you know, they just tell you kind of what we expect to have breakdown. And from there, you're supposed to go back and think about what you want to do. They had two pilot slots. I'm like, man, that is some rough math, you know, 250 <laughs> folks. Now, not all 250 wanted to be a pilot, right. obviously, and not, not all 250 people were qualified with, you know, their eyes and, and whatnot. So I, it wasn't competing with 250 people, but there's a lot of people that wanted to be a pilot. So the math was certainly not in my favor. And that was another challenge of, yeah, you got to do well. I mean, you get ranked and graded on everything physical fitness, your leadership ability, your academics, you get peer reviewed, you, you know, your peers rate you and, you know, anonymously and what they think of you. So you got basically six months to get after it. And at the end, they line you up 250 people in a line, not this is a real line. And you walk into a room and on the room, there's a board and whatever job is available, you can pick. Now, the Marine Corps does this thing called quality spread where they basically cut the class in third. So out of 250 folks, you know, 80, 80, 80 or something around there, the number one guy picks, then the number 81 guy picks, and then the number 161 guy picks or whatever it is. 
And then the number two guy picks. The only job in the Marine Corps that they did not quality spread while I was at the basic school was pilot. So it was going to be the first two guys out of the gate that wanted it, that were qualified, were going to get it. And I got the number two spot. <laughs> um, so, again, it was one of those things that I'm, I, I, I was starting to, in my mind, realize, like, whoa, this, I can do this. Uh, you know, I built this thing up of what I wanted to do. You know, we're, I'm 21 now, you know, 22, I think actually. So it's six years of my life that I've been sort of singularly dedicated to doing this. And so that day where they, my platoon commander, a guy named John Marion, I'll never forget it. He was an F-18 pilot, brings me into his office. It's like, Dave, you're going to be a pilot. And he goes, I think you're going to fly America's airplane. You're going to fly the F-18 Hornet. <laughs> it was an awesome day, man. And, uh, I won't, I won't ever forget it. And, um, that was it. You know, I got my, my ticket. I, I, when I, when I was selected for a pilot, I was ranked, I think like number eight out of 250 in my company. And by the time I graduated, like three weeks later, I was like 25 out of 250. So <laughs> my performance might've declined a little bit after I had achieved you that. You wasn't so, following the theory of no slack. Yeah. There was situation. a little slack in that line. That line was pretty tight for a lot of years. For and, six uh, years. Yeah. And five, you got it. So a little bit of slack there at the end, but, um, I did finish, uh, you know, well enough to get that pilot slot, which is what I always wanted. It was kind of my dream. And what year was that? Uh, that was April of 1995. So I okay. started the basic school in October of 94, right after I got I graduated from college in June. A little delay to get down to Quantico for the basic school. That's six months long. I graduated sometime mid-April. Well, wow, about this time in 1995. So 